Right, find your place in the book of Jonah again tonight. Jonah chapter number one. Jonah chapter number one. While you're turning there, I would like to just uh, go ahead and, and review a little bit for where we have already come from and where we're going. Jonah chapter number one. Uh, I think I have some slides, uh, Pastor Larson, you can put those up for the first review slide just so that everyone can see here. Uh, we're talking about faith in the power of God unto salvation. This really is an expansion of the third major point I had originally intended for this message. Uh, so we're in uh, sub point number two under this, well, I won't lose you in the, in the weeds. The, we, we began this journey looking first off at the futility of paganism, and we saw the pagans that were with Jonah on this vessel searching for the source of their troubles. Under that, we noticed that there was a shipmaster, the captain of this vessel. He gave a self-preserving command to Jonah to arise and cry unto his God, for they would perish. The sailors then uh, were confused about why the storm was threatening their lives. Think about them putting out of port from Joppa on their way across the Mediterranean. Now the storm all of a sudden is upon them, and they're wondering, they're fearing for their lives. The Lord revealed the source of their trouble in their lot. They, they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then uh, we observed that paganism could never completely satisfy. We applied that thought to where we live today as America is more and more becoming pagan, uh, and, it, and it's very concerning. It ought to be very concerning. I was listening to a pastor recently talk about the state of affairs with Christianity, and he was pointing out the fact that uh, we are at uh, an unprecedented place in history yet again where Christianity is being vilified. The Bible is being vilified, and uh, Christians are going to come under heavy persecution. And I agree with his thoughts on that because uh, we haven't learned from the past. We're doomed to repeat our mistakes. So Christianity today is, uh, is seeing the rise of paganism all around us, and uh, Christianity is no longer the bastion of Western society that it once was. Uh, but you show me a place that puts the Bible forward, and I'll show you a place that, uh, that helps people become a moral people, and a people that can be uh, better self-governed, and a people that uh, our founders, I believe, had more in mind uh, with the fabric of our society. Well, these pagans in Jonah's day uh, were crying out to their gods, and we found out through their futile efforts that paganism could never completely satisfy. We then began to look at the rest of the picture here with the foolishness of preaching. And uh, we, we, we saw the pagans here begin to recognize the sovereignty of the Creator. The sailors uh, had an inquisition for Jonah. They asked him uh, why he had brought trouble in their vessel in verse number 8. Jonah was a ready witness, though he was not uh, forthcoming. He was ready when he was asked, and he did give an answer of the hope that lies within him to a certain extent, but he did it minimally. He did it, uh, he did it just to get by, perhaps. And he gave them the truth of who he served and where he was from and pointed them to Jehovah. And uh, we saw how the wording is uh, used to play on words and that Jonah really was the source of their sin. And we talked about him being a picture of Adam and Eve. Uh, wherefore is this sin come upon us? Wherefore is this upon us? Uh, and the same question was posed to other sinners in the Bible. And now the question comes to Jonah through these pagans who look more like God than Jonah does. Pretty sad. We saw Jonah's confession in verse 9 of his true master. He gave them a right witness from the right word. We saw the sailors fear. They're, they're terrified uh, because they are culpable, perhaps in their mind. They're guilty of aiding and abetting Jonah as he runs from Jehovah's commission that was given in the first part of the chapter. In verse 10, we see Jonah's witness was ratified through these pagans in their righteous wonder. They stood in awe. They began to see some things that were bigger than themselves. And the sailors then uh, continue in their superstition, though. They're seeking for the solution to their troubles. And uh, verse 11, we see that they begin to receive this witness, and their heart begins to be worked on. But you have all the wisdom of paganism confounded in the foolishness of Jonah's preaching. And to continue the review in verse number 12, the last time we were together, we saw how crazy Jonah's gospel, I use air quotes around that word, was to them. He said, take me up and throw me over into the sea. That doesn't make sense. It's, it's beyond human reason. 
they doesn't, it doesn't mesh with what this captain thinks about protecting the lives on his vessel. Why would someone say this? Jonah says, just get rid of me and your troubles will go away. This is, uh, I believe we could apply this as, as a faith that they're called upon to have that is really beyond human reason. And is it not so when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, one man died for the whole world, one man died, a sinless man, a substitute? Uh, it doesn't make sense as to why God would do it this way, but this is the plan of redemption. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. And it's through the Son of God that He gave for our, our salvation. And so we see uh, the pagans and Jonah receiving the salvation of Jehovah. And it comes through Jonah's crazy gospel, as crazy as it sounds, for them to take him up and throw him over the side. That word, uh, take me up, is really lift up. We saw in this a type of Christ, the second Adam, because Jonah would be a substitution uh, for them. And uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. It was not so with Jonah. Not so with Jonah. Jonah, sadly, was a preacher who, as one writer put it, was willing to die rather than to see these lost people get saved. He was willing to die. You think about the Ninevites. He was running from his mission to take uh, the news of God's wrath to them so that they could find repentance because he knew God would spare them if they changed their mind about their violence and their wicked ways. And yet this preacher was willing to die rather than to see these lost people, these lost Ninevites get saved. David Jeremiah said one time, I'm reminded of those pairs of witnesses who knock on our doors several times a year trying to offer us a gospel that is not even true. I know who he's talking about because I was cleaning up behind them when I was handing out VBS flyers on the street back here. There are about eight of them, and uh, they were looking for Spanish-speaking Jehovah's Witness people that they could proselytize. And, and they're right here down Mead. So, um, yeah, they, they do that. And they are proliferate at it as well. But David Jeremiah says they offer us a gospel that's not even true. They trudge up and down the sidewalks, crossing paths with the young missionary men who traverse our cities on bicycles, spreading yet another false message. wonder who he's talking about there. Uh, they, they put many of us Christians to shame with their zeal and with their energy. We have the true message of salvation in Jesus Christ and yet refuse to lift a finger to tell those who need it. Boy, that's... Uh, that's convicting, isn't it? Why is America in the state she's in? Could we not say judgment begins at the house of God? Jonah instructed these lost men, these lost sailors, to throw him overboard. And Jonah told them how they could receive immediate physical temporary relief. But he did not tell them how they could have eternal life with the God that he knew. Here's an amen statement. Don't ever ask a backslidden Christian anything about spiritual matters. As it's been well said, sin takes you farther than you want to go. Jonah paid the fare thereof. He went down into the ship. He went down into the sea. He's going to go down even further. Sin takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it costs you more than you ever want to pay. Jonah chapter number one, look with me beginning at verse number 12, And he, Jonah, said unto them, Take me up, or lift me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they, note the words, took up, they lifted up Jonah, just like he told them to do, they followed through. They lifted him up. They took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea and watch. And the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord 
and made vows. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the preaching and teaching of your word tonight. I ask that you wouldn't let any, anything distract us from what you would have for us tonight as we prepare to approach your table. Thank you for this commemoration, for this memorial service that you put in place, Lord, to help us have a, a time of revival within ourselves, to help us look forward to your, your, your return, Lord. May that be imminent, and we pray even so come, Lord Jesus. But Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us to do our part to examine ourselves tonight as we approach your word. If there be anything in us that would be between us and you or us and anyone else, I pray that through these next moments and the time of tarrying we have one for another, that we'd be able to do that and we would be able to come to this table as you've bidden your people, your disciples to come and partake and remember what you did for us. Thank you, Lord, for being a greater than Jonah. Thank you for bearing our sin willingly and dying in our place as though you were us for us thank you lord for saving my soul i pray that you'll encourage us tonight in the scriptures in jesus name amen only when these pagan mariners ceased from their own efforts in humble faith in the foolishness of jonah's message did they find the peace from the storm of sin that had come upon their vessel if we are to have faith in the power of God, it is to do as, uh, as He pleases. You see, God is sovereign over all the affairs of mankind, and yet there is, a, there is a place of faith. There is a place where we come and whosoever will may come. And we exercise that, but we do so acknowledging that God is the sovereign creator. And I can't explain all of that, and if I ever could, then uh, we might be in trouble because, well, I think there's only one person in the universe that can really explain all that's going on there. And uh, God has revealed Himself to us, and we can seek to learn from Him, to learn to fear Him. I want you to receive the Word of God. I, I want you to cease from your own efforts. I appreciated Pastor Ward's message this morning. Just spot on for where we're at right here in the book of Jonah. It's not through our own reformation that we're going to find what we need. Amen, Pastor Ward. It is through faith in Jesus Christ and these men come to the end of themselves and we'll see that hopefully here tonight. Faith in the power of God and the salvation is faith in a crazy gospel. Yes, as crazy as Jonah's words sounded to them, it is beyond human reason and yet we shouldn't be surprised in their initial rejection of what they deemed irrational. When you go and tell someone about Jesus Christ and how they can put their faith in Him, especially someone who has a, a religious background, they're going to look at you and think you are crazy. There's nothing that I can bring. Nothing in my hand I bring. Only to the cross of Christ I cling. You mean I'm saved by faith, but, but faith alone? You mean there's no sacrament that I can do? There's nothing that I can do to please this God in heaven? No, there is nothing you can please. All, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before His sight. That is a vivid picture. If you know the language behind that, Isaiah is talking about leprous wrappings. Wrappings around people's hands that had leprosy. You think about that disease, it, it, everything it comes in contact with, it, we grieve over the, the, the consequences that cancer brings on people today. You think about leprosy, this was an awful, awful disease, and, and it comes in contact with anything, and it just destroys it from what I understand. And these leprous cloths, you know, when you have leprosy, from what I've read, you lose feeling in your hands and your limbs and things, and you don't even know. You, so someone with leprosy could just bump something, and then, and then they're, they die from bleeding out because they didn't even know they were cut. And so they would bandage themselves with these rags to keep that from happening. These kind of rags, friend, are fit for nothing but the burn barrel. And yet... All the good things, all the righteousnesses that we would do in God's sight, he says all of that is fit for the burn barrel. It's all contaminated by sin. And so when we tell people that there is a righteousness that is found in Christ alone and an imputed righteousness from his sinless life, it doesn't make sense. You can't compute that. I'm sorry, it just doesn't add up. 
It sounds crazy. So we shouldn't be surprised when a pagan world can't wrap their mind around this. A pagan world that's used to bringing things to, to appease gods and to think about how they can, they can come to terms with the gods that are out there. There's an initial rejection because not only is this a faith beyond human reason, this is a faith beyond human resources. Look at the text again in verse number 13. It says, nevertheless, they heard the word. Jonah said, take me up and throw me over into the sea. Cast me forth into the sea and the sea will be calm. That's all they had to do. And yet, nevertheless, no matter what Jonah said, they said, no, there has to be a way. We're going to row. We're going to row. We're going to row. And it says here very, very vividly, nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it, to bring the ship to the land. Notice the next phrase. But they could not. To row hard here, literally, the, the image is they dug their oars in and they are doing everything with their human effort to not have to follow what Jonah said, to not have to do what Jonah said to throw him over because they knew that would mean certain death for him. It had to be. There's no other way than for Jonah to die if he goes overboard, especially in a storm like they're in. And they tried, and they tried, and they tried. And yet, in the end, the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. This is a faith not only beyond human reason, this is a faith beyond all human resources. They dug in with their oars. It, you know, it's a lot like the notion of governments today, and I won't name which one, Washington, D.C., or anything like that, that, you know, they want to put solar blockers in the atmosphere with all of these efforts uh, against this so-called enemy of climate change. Please don't misunderstand me here. It's amazing what pseudoscience tries to push on those who would be gullible. Don't misunderstand me. I am all for, and I am a proponent of, being a good steward of the wonderful creation that God has given to us, but I am adamantly against mankind that does these crazy things to God's cosmos. Let me illustrate what I mean from the Bible. Because that's all I have to stand on is the Bible. I can't stand on my own human reason. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 5, particularly in the next verses after verse 22. The next verses after Jeremiah 5.22. So Jeremiah, in, in, in the next verses after that, rebukes Israel for not acknowledging that he controls their weather. Whose weather? Israel's weather. I want to make that clear. In the nation of Israel, under this covenant, God controlled their weather. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23 says, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. Is he talking about Israel or is he talking about Washington, D.C. today? Well, he's talking about Israel, okay. They are revolted and gone. Crazy things going on in the West Wing. Crazy stuff happening over there. We're in trouble. Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain. What does the Lord God give? Rain. Both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us, unto the nation of Israel in this context, the appointed weeks of harvest. Verse 25 says, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. Your iniquities have turned away these things. That is, uh, it's turned away the rains and the harvest seasons. This passage sounds remarkably similar to proponents of, of dangerous global warming today. They, they fear a fragile, out-of-control climate pattern that's going to destroy the earth, right? Right? But they, they, they say not in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives its rain in its season, basically. And so we have an underlying cause of fears of dangerous global warming that, that just might not be science, okay? Don't throw anything at me too hard, but it might not be science. But really it's rooted in a, in a rejection of belief in God. 
in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul speaks similarly of, of people who, um, here's the, the, the biblical word, hold or um, suppress the truth about God's existence and His attributes. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed. Question, what was Jonah supposed to go reveal to Nineveh? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress, they push down, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. We love our sin too much. They, um, they don't honor God. They don't give Him thanks like they should. The context goes on to explain how they become futile in, their, in the way that they think. I'm paraphrasing. Verse 21 tells us that though. Surely it includes people who don't honor God or give thanks to Him for the brilliant order, for the, for the structure of His creation. So, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and um, they worship and serve creation. They worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. What a description. Could we apply that to many movements today, perhaps? Environmentalist movements, different things. I'm, I'm going to make a lot of friends tonight through this message. You know, the Mother Earth people yeah. rather than the one true God who ought to be their, their highest object of devotion. No, they misplaced that in creation. I don't expect everyone to agree with me, by the way. But I think this is a good observation of where we are and uh, some of the roots of the moral compromise and the moral decay of the foundations that we once enjoyed, by and large. There's plenty of other passages of, of Scripture that would also affirm God's control over the earth's weather. Um, if you're writing and you want to write fast, you can write these down. But Leviticus chapter 26, verse 18 to 20, we're not going to turn there and read it, but Leviticus 26, 18 to 20. Deuteronomy 28, 12, and uh, chapters 23 and 24, or Deuteronomy 28, verses 23 and 24, excuse me. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 1, 1 Kings <laughs> chapter 17 and 18. Some of you are in your mind going through your catalog of scriptures going, oh yeah, I know what he's talking about there. That's the story of Elijah. God does control the weather, friend. Amen. He controlled it for Elijah. Job knew that God controlled the weather of the earth. Job 37, verses 9 through 13. The Psalms talk about it. Psalm 107, a beautiful psalm, beautiful poetry. Psalm 107, verses 23 to 28 talk about how God controls the weather. Amos chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Our passage here, Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through the end of the chapter, show us how God controls the weather. He cast this uh, wind into the sea. God controlled the weather that these sailors were in. And then if you want uh, one for the New Testament, you're already ahead of me. You know where I'm going with this. Uh, but Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26 and 27, where Jesus, uh, Jesus has some words about the lack of the faith of his disciples. Peace, be still. How can he do that if he's not God? How can he calm the storm like that if, if he's not God? What manner of man is this? So we see the sailors initially reject Jonah's word. They dig in with their oars. They say, this can't be. This is, this is crazy. This is beyond human reason. Take you up and throw you over into the sea. This is beyond human resources. They rode hard. They rode hard. And nevertheless, though they tried everything they could, they could not bring it to the land because the sea wrought against them was tempestuous. This was a wind from the Lord. Friend, you're not going to win that battle. It's like Abraham Lincoln when he was asked, you know, if God was on his side. He says, I'd rather be concerned whether, uh, you know, I'm on God's side. I think it was him. That may be misattributed, but um, I, I think I remember somebody telling me that was attributed to Abraham Lincoln somewhere along the way. Are we on God's side or is God on our side? Well, I want to be on God's side. We see their supplication for salvation in verse 14. This is a faith now. Yeah, it's a faith beyond human reason. It's a faith that goes beyond human resources. This is a faith 
that then receives the word of God by hearing. You know the verse, Romans 10, 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of God. What false and empty religion failed to achieve, what every human effort for reformation could never attain, simple childlike faith in the word of God. Yes, as crazy it was through Jonah, take me up and throw me over in the sea. As crazy as that was, his words were scripture to them. And they're scripture for us because they're inspired in our Bible. It was through his messenger they came to fully realize that a substitute for the wages of sin was not only necessary, but it was provided for them for their salvation. Verse number 14, look at it. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord. They cried unto Jehovah. Note that word, they cried unto Him. And said, we beseech thee, to beseech is to beg. We beseech thee, O Lord, If in case you didn't hear him the first time, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. He's sovereign. They recognize that. He did as he pleased, and, uh, and he's having his way. The deliverance portrayed in the book of Jonah, remember though, it's only temporal. This is only a temporal deliverance. But it all points us uh, in a picture, if you will, to a greater truth that, than even what Jonah portrays himself. And that is that you and I today stand in need of eternal deliverance. And that can only be found in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who said of himself, a greater than Jonah is here. Spurgeon wrote this. I'll give you his words. In his uh, in, in devotional Bible, the interpreter. Herein Jonah, who was an eminent type of our Lord Jesus, sets before us the doctrine of substitution in a figure. Jesus is cast into the sea of wrath and it beca becomes calm to us. This is the most glorious of all revealed truths and most needful to be believed and personally rested in Jonah, in, in the verse before us, appears in an amiable light as clothed with humility, a true penitent ready to receive chastisement without complaint. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. The mildness of Jonah and his deep concern for their safety touched their hearts. Take me up, cast me forth into the sea. And they resolved to save him if they could, but all in vain. In a figure, we are here taught the spiritual truth that no toiling of our own can save us. It is by the death of the substitute, and he put a capital S on that word substitute. I know who he was referring to. The death of the substitute alone. It is by the death of the substitute alone that we can be delivered. So we see the sailor's supplication for salvation in verse 14. We see their salvation by substitutionary death in verses 15 and 16. This is a faith that, that, that is beyond human reason. It is a faith that goes beyond all human resources. This is a faith that receives the Word of God by hearing, and it is a faith that responds to the Word of God by heeding or doing. We hear the Word, we must heed the Word, right? James has a lot to say about being doers of the Word and, uh, and, and hearers of the Word you see, if, if we're only a hearer and not a doer, we deceive ourselves. Verse 15 says, so they took up Jonah. They lifted him up. Exact words that he used before, they're following it to a T. They did exactly what Jonah said, and they're doing it now because, well, what else are they going to do? They've tried it all now. They took up Jonah and cast him forth. Same word that the Lord used to cast that wind into the sea. And, and in the same word that Jonah said, cast me over. Now they take him up and they cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. Imagine that. On the brink of death. And all of a sudden, at obedience to the crazy word that was spoken to them. It just becomes calm. You tell me God didn't show up. 
God showed up. God showed up. Everybody in this book eventually calls on God. The sailors, Jonah, the Ninevites. The word is kara, and it means both to call or to cry out. Jonah 1.6 says, So the shipmaster came, uh, came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 14 that we read, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, has, has done as it pleased thee. Jonah chapter 2, and verse number 2. Jonah said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Fast forward to Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. It's a good verse for Denver, by the way. This is a story... As old Adrian Rogers put it, of substitutionary death. I loved old Dr. Rogers, a great preacher of the last century. Now, I know he was a Southern Baptist, and he probably wouldn't have too much fellowship with me being an independent Baptist, but uh, he preached from the King James Bible, and he preached it straight, amen? I appreciated his ministry there at Bellevue, and he, um, he had quite a legacy to fulfill with R.G. Lee and some of those old-time preachers. R.G. Lee preached a message called Payday Someday. If you hadn't ever heard that message, even if you got to get your old LP record out, go listen to it. You don't know what an LP is? Okay, it's before CDs and even before 8-tracks and all that. You don't even know what an 8-track is. <laughs> old Adrian Rogers, he said, uh, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers said, this is a story of substitutionary death. Now, here's what happened that day. Jonah got on board that ship, and not only did God prepare a fish, but God prepared a great wind, and God sent a great storm, and that storm began to buffet and lash that ship and beat upon that ship, and it looked like the ship was going down. And Jonah said, the only way that this ship can be saved is if you throw me overboard. If I'm sacrificed, the rest of you are going to be saved. Now, what's that a picture of? Dr. Rogers said, this is a picture of the vicarious substitutionary sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This vessel buffeted by those storms pictures lost humanity enduring the wrath of God. The storms of God's wrath headed for certain wreck and certain doom upon the reefs of judgment. Jonah we know is a picture in this instance of the Lord Jesus Christ and it was necessary that Jonah be sacrificed in order that the others might live. Now notice Jonah couldn't jump overboard. Uh, that would have destroyed the picture according to Dr. Rogers again. Jonah said you're going to have to take me up and throw me overboard. It was a picture that the Lord Jesus Christ has been crucified by our hands. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? He said, yes, you were there. I was there. It was for our sins that he suffered. He bled and died. And so Jonah had to be thrown overboard. He had to be sacrificed by them. Uh, now, they didn't want to do this. He goes on to recount this. He says they wanted to try some other ways. For example, uh, verse 5, uh, they were afraid. They cried every man unto his God. But he said false religion couldn't deliver them. They cast forth the wares that were in the sea to lighten uh, the ship into the sea to lighten them of it in verse 5. Not only did false religion not help them, but the self-effort of getting rid of those things that were on board didn't help them. Now, so many people, uh, he says, will turn to false religion and find no salvation. Man, it sounds like he pilfered my notes. Uh, the futility of paganism. I don't, uh, now, so many people, they turn to false religion and find no salvation. Many people will try to lighten the ship, as it were, by getting rid of the things in their lives. Hearkening to Pastor Ward's message again this morning about reformation, turning over a new leaf. It's not going to work. It never works. Uh, lust, pride, the anger, the debauchery, all of those things. Uh, that is, this is a picture of reformation, but it's still no good. Verse 13, nevertheless, they rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. That represents effort, sweat, toil, tears, but no good. You see, he was talking to Bellevue that day. He said, dear friend, this congregation today, there will be those who will try some religion other than the Christian religion, some way other than the Lord Jesus Christ to still the storm within their bosom and the storms of God's wrath. They cannot do it. False religion cannot do it. Uh, there are others who think, well, somehow if I can just turn over a new leaf, if I can just reform 
Uh, if I can just lighten the ship, if I can get these things out of my life, then it'll be all right. And others might say, well, I'm going to do good things. I'm going to do good deeds. I'm, I'm going to row the boat ashore. You can't do it. Salvation, Jonah found out, is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. That's Jonah's word. Chapter 2, verse 9, he said, salvation is of the Lord. What false worship couldn't do, what reformation, lightning the ship couldn't do, what human effort, toil, tears, sweat couldn't do, a substitutionary sacrifice did. Amen. Immediately, immediately the sea ceased. There was a calm, there was a peace. God's teaching us there's no way to have peace with God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a good place for an amen. There's no reformation. There's no resource. There's no power, neither within the, the feeble and finite mind or within the, the grasp of the uh, impotent hand of mankind that can suffice to accomplish what God alone does when it comes to our salvation. Row as they would, try as they might, these seasoned sailors came to the end of themselves where they realized that no human effort could bring these men to safety. As Jonah will attest in his Song of the Sea, salvation is of the Lord. Have you responded to the Lord by calling upon Him alone to deliver you? Romans 10, 13, the same chapter that says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, says this earlier on, just a few verses ahead of that in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We come now to Jonah's supernatural deliverance by God's unexpected and, may I say, quite undeserved grace. Verse 17, all the way through the first part of chapter 2 in our, in our King James Bible, this is a faith that rejoices in the power of God unto salvation. It's a faith beyond human reason. It's a faith beyond all human resources. It's a faith uh, that that receives the Word of God. It's a faith that, that then heeds the Word of God. It's a faith that rejoices in the power of God unto salvation. Now the Lord, maybe you want to circle this next word, had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Yeah, the book really doesn't say that much about the fish except for right here, and yet Anytime we talk about Jonah, this is the only thing people really focus on is the fish. Even the slides I had up here, this is the big fish up there, the big whale. And yet, it's only one of many ways throughout the book that we see God working. Let's not magnify the fish so much that we miss the rest of the message. But the fish is important because... It has a job. It's prepared of the Lord. That's an important word, prepare. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. This is a story of supernatural deliverance. Picture of substitutionary death, yes, but it's also a picture of supernatural deliverance. The one who has prepared... Uh, mana, uh, to, it means to assign, to, to number, to appoint this fish. The one who did that is none other than Jehovah. It's all caps Lord. He is the one who appointed this fish. Um, can I use another word? It's in an, in, an, in an intensive form of the language. When it's translated, it, it is intensive. It's prepared, yes, but it has the meaning really of a special assignment. Should you choose to accept it, this message will destruct. And this is a special assignment. God's, uh, God's 007 here in this fish. I'm just kidding. The word means to ordain. This fish was ordained. You know, I, I appreciate uh, Tate Thronson. He's down in Castle Rock. He preached a message on Jonah, and, and he really focused on this fish. He brought out something that I'd never thought about before. If you've heard him tell this story, he does a lot better than I can here for you tonight. But think about this, the miraculous nature of this preparation. Somewhere along the line, uh, Pastor Thronson mentioned that this fish had to be a minnow somewhere. How did this minnow escape the hook 
And how did this minnow not become bait for something else? Somehow, you know, the Mediterranean's a big sea. Somehow this fish got past the stage of a minnow and, and escaped those dangers and swam around the Mediterranean. Somehow he just happened to be in this spot on the Mediterranean at this time, right when they decided to throw Jonah over and he just happened to be there. It's kind of like old Ruth, whose hap was to light upon a portion of the field belonging to, well, the kinsman redeemer. How about that? No coincidence here. Why? Because the word says this fish was ordained for this. This fish was prepared for this. The Lord uses this fish for supernatural deliverance. You know, God prepares other things through the book of Jonah. Uh, let's, let's see at least uh, these few times where we see God preparing things. Chapter 4 and verse number 6, same word. The Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, prepared a gourd. Uh, this gourd has a special assignment for Jonah. And made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, we read in the very next verse, but God prepared a worm <laughs> when the morning arose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. Just like he prepared the gourd, he also prepared the worm. Chapter 4, verse 8. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God, what? Prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. Where is he? He's in Nineveh now. He's made it back and he's crossed over. This would be a, this would be a vehement east wind. Don't minimize the words of a vehement east wind. This was something that you don't want to be in. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted, wished, himself, wished in himself to die, and said it is better for me to die than to live. See, God is preparing things all along for, for Jonah. This word is used, interestingly, of, of all the non-human agents provided by God to bring Jonah back to his calling. Jonah is swallowed. That usually means death. It usually has the connotation of entering the underworld uh, that the Jewish people talked about as Sheol. In fact, that's the very word Jonah used in chapter 2. Sheol. Proverbs 1.12 would be another reference there to put down. But Jonah is delivered from Sheol. He is delivered. Because this fish has been prepared. It's been appointed for an extraordinary deliverance. Think this through, okay? The fish saves Jonah from drowning by swallowing or engulfing him. And by the way, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man is going to be in the heart of the earth. How long? Three days and three nights. Well, I wind this down with a poem. Father Time met pale King Death sitting by a tomb. Hello, old friend. I guess you're here to seal somebody's doom. You might say that, sly Death replied. A smile slid up his face. Inside reposes that Jesus man who said he'd save the race. And you, Time... Why are you stopping here? Don't you have things to do? Well, I come each day to draw the veil and let the morning through. Say, why are you watching just one grave with all your vast domain? Looks like you'd be out rambling round, smiting folks with pain. Well, this one's something special. He challenged me, they say. Said he'd rest here just three days, then stir and walk away. Now, I'm the conqueror, you know. They don't talk up to me. When I steps in to cut them down, it's for eternity. I can sure testify to that, responded Father Time. I ain't seen one shake off the dust since you've been in your prime. Well, I got other things to do. I must be on my way. I'll see you when I come back by to make another day. So whiskered Time 
went up the hill to bid the sun to rise, and he left death standing by the tomb looking strong and wise. Next day, time ambled by again, and how are things, he queried. Kind of quiet, death replied. I'm starting to be wearied. I won't be here when you come by about this time tomorrow. I'm anxious to be on my way and spread some grief and sorrow. Now, Father Time was quite surprised when he came back to see death a-quivering on the ground in a frightful agony. His eyes were set, his throat was marked, his clothes in disarray. It wasn't difficult to see that death had had his day. What happened, death? asked Father Time. What makes you look so bad? I've never seen you shake this way or seem so scared and sad. Death pulled himself up on a rock, looking sick and humble, hung his head and wrung his hands, and time could hear him mumble, was sitting here before the dawn, about to take my stroll, when all at once this whole wide world began to reel and roll. That rolling stone jumped off the door and skipped down the hill. Then everything grew dark and quiet, seemed like the earth stood still. I saw him standing at the door. He didn't move or speak, just looked at me, and all at once I felt so tired and weak. He came and got a hold on me, threw me to the ground, put his feet, put his foot here on my neck, took the keys, took my keys and my crown. Two angels came to talk with him. They glistened like the sun. He said, the plan's all finished now. Redemption's work is done. As they passed the garden gate, I heard him say just then, he set and free my captives and given gifts to men. Time and death met once again off yonder by the gate. It's good to see you, said old time. I've wondered about your fate. Well, I'm just a lowly servant now. There's little time to roam. I just push open this old gate and help the saints get home. I like that. Praise the Lord. Story of supernatural deliverance. Now that's a poem. But I want to tell you what you read when you turn to Luke chapter 24 and you read about the ladies that came to that tomb in John chapter 20 and 21. You read about Matthew's account and what Mark said. That's reality. Scriptures say He is not here for He is risen as He said. Praise the Lord. Now old death is just opening the gate to let the saints go on to glory. By believing in Jonah's crazy gospel, these pagans came to a place where they could, they could believe, they could fear Jehovah. Now their deliverance was temporal. But this is the Jehovah God of Israel, the one true God who is sovereign over all. These pagans, in, in the story of Jonah here, they received deliverance from imminent certain destruction, from, an, from a watery grave. Jonah received deliverance from and through temporal judgment. He received deliverance from loss of future reward. As God's child, God spared him. Whoever you are today, believer, unbeliever alike, you need salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The same way we're saved is the same way we're sanctified. Read the book of Galatians. We're saved by grace through faith. We are sanctified by grace through faith. How's the Lord working in your life, perhaps like a Jonah, to keep you from temporal judgment and from loss of future reward? How do we apply a message like this to make sure that we're not in rebellion, rejecting? that we're not gaining wrath, but instead that we are faithfully offering the hope of the gospel to those around us. Consider four things. Number one, go on the offensive. And uh, you might want to start that, I don't know, Monday morning might even be too late. Go on the offensive as soon as you walk out of these doors with the gospel. When you arrive at work after the weekend, someone may ask you, well, how was your weekend weekend? That's an opportunity for you to reply with the gospel. Hey, I heard a great sermon at church on Sunday that explained, you know, and, and maybe tie Jesus in somehow, how you heard your preacher, you heard your pastor stand up and tell people about Jesus. How was your weekend? Share a 30 to 60 second synopsis 
of one of the main points that you heard from the weekend and take that with you and carry that through the week. Go on the offense. Secondly, be clear on the gospel and its significance. Be clear. Jonah didn't seem to grasp the significance of his calling. His message was the only hope for these idol worshipers in the midst of God's storm of judgment. Similarly, when we go out from this place, we're going to encounter sinners before a thrice holy God, people who are deserving of His deepest and eternal wrath. And our message about Christ's substitutionary work as God's propitiation for sin, as the one who alone defeated death, is the, is the only message of hope for lost people. So number one, go on the offensive. Number two, be clear when you share the gospel. Number three, pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Share it clearly. Share it courageously. Share it humbly. If anybody is going to give you an audience, give a hearing and you feel like they, you've got their ear to tell them about the life-saving message of Jesus Christ, it's going to depend on the working of God's power. You can't do it through human effort. You can't do it through human reason. It's by the Spirit and God's power. We're to pray that we would be able to speak boldly, right? Number four, actively and regularly invite people within your sphere of influence to come to church with you on Sunday. Just get out there and invite them. Hey, come to church with me on Sunday. The gospel needs to be in and through this church. And Pastor Ward, I think we, we do as best as we can, humanly speaking, to make sure that everybody who comes through these doors receives the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's keep our church that way. Keep it a place where they can come and, uh, and hear the, the hymns of the faith sung. And we can pray together and have a time of spirit and worship together according to the Word of God. And, and, and in the ordinances, what we do tonight in observing the Lord's Supper, even that preaches a message to a lost and dying world. That we still believe in Jesus. That we remember what He told us to do when we gather. We speak the good news because the Lord Jesus, when He came down from heaven to a place of great evil, He came down to this earth. He came using His words. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. We look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith.